word, and a true word goes swiftly from the ear to the heart, and from the heart to the world around us all. Amen. Well, sitting around the table and uh, chowing down on some food on Tuesday night, I don't even remember what we were eating. I think it was rubber chicken of some kind. <laughs> Gary, Moore, Gary Moore asked me, what are you going to preach about next Sunday? Now, first of all, uh, thank you for asking, Gary. It's, uh, it's uh, nice to think that somebody's even thinking about what's coming up preaching-wise. Um, and uh, so, but I responded to Gary, and I said, well, it's... Uh, it's going to be an invitation, and it's going to be a very short one, and one that I'm going to need to explain. And the invitation is to come die with me. Somebody else at 8 o'clock heard dine with me, do. <laughs> come die with me. And in this Advent season, allow me to extend that invitation, but with a bit of an explanation. Happened is a framework for us to put this invitation into context. And it allows us to see this kind of an invitation in the light of what's transpired in the previous church year as a helpful guide to becoming prepared for what's going to be coming in the upcoming year. And importantly, it's an opportunity for our community to celebrate the coming of Christ in just a few weeks' time. The invitation I offer here is specifically to die a death in a wilderness. The kind of wilderness described in today's gospel taken from Matthew's, Matthew's book, but with a bit of a difference. The wilderness I'd like to speak of, and that we might set as the backdrop for John's dramatic appearance in the gospel, is the wilderness that we might see every Sunday and in church today. Every wise and sincere church community, including ours here at St. Augustine of Canterbury, works hard to be a warm, welcoming, and inviting place. We have those smileys in our pocket. And we're actually getting very, very good at handing them out, and not in an artificial way, but handing them out from the heart. And increasingly, we're hearing people stop and remark at how friendly a place St. Augustine is. So, we're doing everything that can be done to make newcomers feel invited and welcome. But nonetheless, our worship time is also something of a wilderness, where each and every one of us get to reflect on what has transpired in our lives, either recently or maybe a long time ago. We individually wonder about all that is unknown and frightening, what's coming, how will I deal with this, how will they respond to that, and these things cause us to sometimes double and even triple check those things that are central in our life, the things we want to hang on to, the things we hold dear and find reassuring. And no matter how beautiful the sanctuary of our church, and, you know, Plywood can be beautiful, although it's going to be more beautiful in a few days, the pews are where each of us sit with our worries, our responsibilities, and all of life's challenges, whether they be great or small. So the pew is a kind of wilderness where we confront the tempests and the thorns of life, and for many of us also to reflect on the emptiness of our lives, our loneliness. All of this is the stuff of life, and we bring it all to the pews. As we reflect on the gospel scene for today, it's easy to encounter John the Baptist in a way that suggests the harshest wilderness of all is perhaps the heart of the hearer. We're told in Matthew's gospel that people went out to the river Jordan to bear themselves before John in order to confess their sins. Now sins as a topic is somewhat churchy and somewhat religious, I think you would agree. And we all tend to deflect the matter in our hearts as a result. But that doesn't take away from the fact that what happens in the heart and in the pew is a matter of critical importance in our relationship with Christ. 
Because in the pews, there's no fancy doctrine of sin being evaluated and debated at an intellectual level. As individuals, we all have the direct experience of difficulty in life, and we all desire to be rid of it. We know that we have ourselves to contend with, and in much of our relationships and undertakings, sometimes it's as though we're our own worst enemy. It's as though we're unable to get out of our own way sometimes. We make life's decisions that we regret later. We are, in effect, a spiritual wilderness in which the power of the gospel and the redeeming love of Christ are fairly itching to burst forth and be received. <coughs> if there's one thing attractive in today's gospel story, it has to be the way in which John does not shrink from speaking directly to individuals who have gathered to hear him proclaim the great message of Advent. That one greater than any of us has come, ready to proclaim and to confer grace through the Holy Spirit upon anyone who would hear him. When the Sadducees and Pharisees show up, no doubt lurking around on the periphery of the crowd, curious about events going on that day by the river, John addresses them directly and without hesitation. He calls a spade a spade and challenges the duplicity of those who would espouse genealogical-based privilege for themselves in contraver contravention to the will of God. The finger gets pointed, and John lays before them a challenge. Bear fruit worthy of repentance. And he can almost see him at work, pointing at them, pointing upward, with his jaw thrust forward that leaves nobody in doubt of the faith behind his courage. What John the Evangelist does here on the banks of the River Jordan is the equivalent of giving a thumping, rousing speech on the perils of militarism and army and war to a room filled with the Joint Chiefs of Staff. He bravely calls them out of their complacency and their sense of privilege, falsely worn of class and entitlement among those who would appoint themselves as the children of Abraham, as though the Isaiah heritage was exclusive to them. He knows that these individuals, in the hardness of their hearts, have yet to undertake their own personal wilderness journey, and are therefore not yet ready to receive the full measure of God's redemptive love as those who have. But John, in his fury, in the same breath, offers both a warning of the consequences of not bearing good fruit, while at the same time pointing out that even a stone as that symbol of a hard, cold human heart can be raised up as children of Abraham and inheritors of God's purpose. And what is this act, this symbol that John invites them to, as the purifying act that would lead them to power of the Spirit that is Christ? The answer is one word. Baptism. Baptism. And here the act is rich with symbolism. To be fully immersed in water, to be cleansed in water deep enough to die in. And in this act, the true meaning of God's invitation and the means of redemption are made one. Those who offer up their sins to God will be washed free of them by being submerged and undergoing a symbolic death to the old ways, followed by a spiritual resurfacing and rescue into the new life of love, purpose, and light. That's God's true intent for all of us. Here, the pain and deprivation that is the wilderness of the heart is forever cleansed and made whole by the act of baptism, the drowning of a past and the resurrection of a joyous future in Christ. And one comes before the other. First, the experience of that wilderness pain. And I suspect that many of us know exactly in our hearts what's meant by that. But it's followed by the joy in the certainty of resurrection. And all we have to do is to accept the invitation to die and be raised again in Him. This journey of discernment, repentance, and forgiveness has everything to do with our future as a Christian community and as an Anglican church. Our prospects are closely tied to this invitation and our response to it. To the extent that we undertake the wilderness journey, 
confronting the beasts and the demonic te tendencies that live there, then to conquer them by accepting the redemption that is Christ. In that continuum of faith will our future be found. A couple of gentlemen wrote an interesting book in 1989 entitled Resident Aliens, and here they're referring to Christians. Resident Aliens, a Christian assessment of ministry for people who know something's wrong. And they write this. There's nothing much wrong with the church that cannot be fixed by God calling out 100 or so really insensitive, uncaring, self-centered people into the full ministry of the church. <laughs> Amen. <coughs> Mia culpa too. Of course, by ministry, what he means here is the exercise of a servant heart. That's what's really meant. Not a colored ministry, not ordination. It's the ministry that each and every one of us support as we work for the church. A servant heart that has undergone the transit from through its own wilderness and broken free into eternal life through baptism. A heart that in response to God's pointing the finger and saying, well, the answer is, I'm in. And before any of us are prone to dismissing or turning a blind eye to this standing invitation, let me remind you of this. Has God ever failed to deliver wonderful things when he welcomes an open heart into the faith? What about the invitation to Mary to the Immaculate Conception? And she responds, I am the handmaiden of the Lord. What did that lead to? What about the journey of the wise men? And here, you know, I can see in my mind the servants who just get told of what the wise men are going to do by way of the journey. And they look at, you know, look at the, at the Lord and say, we're, we're going to do what? We're, wait a minute, we're going to stumble out into the night, we're going to freeze our butts off, there's scorpions crawling around, the place is crawling with bandits, and we don't know what we're going for? And we're going to navigate how? Huh? Some, some star? Really? <laughs> Do I have to come to you? But what did that lead to? What about Jesus' invitation to Peter and the other disciples to simply follow me? What did that lead to? And what about God knocking the Saul of Tarsus off his mule on the road to Damascus, blinding him for three days, and then inviting him to service in Christ? What did that lead to? In a few months' time, God willing, I hope we're going to have the opportunity to return to this theme of baptism as central to who we are as a Christian people, an Easter people, and as children of God. At that time, I hope we're going to be able to share a different kind of invitation in this approach to Easter time. But in the meantime, God invites each of us. He's extending an invitation to each of us and indeed the whole church, to die and subsequently be reborn afresh in the sense that John the Baptist would understand that invitation. <coughs> to do this during Advent is entirely fitting because this is a time of preparation, of transit and emerging from our own individual wilderness. It's a time to contemplate the meaning of the Incarnation as God's immeasurable and fully undeserved gift to us. Should we accept this invitation to a journey, then the path forward to forgiveness, joy, and peace has been clearly laid out for us. These joys will become our joy and the inheritance of a church born afresh in the true faith. <laughs>